Hello, and welcome to the University of Washington Cardiometabolic Echo Session 11. I'm Nicole Earhart, one of the adult endocrinologists here at the University of Washington in the Diabetes Institute. Today, we're really excited to have our nephrologist, Matt Rivera, talk to us about guidelines for kidney and diabetes, specifically focusing on blood pressure medications, blood pressure optimization, and nutrition. Additionally, we have a great group of panelists today, including Nyan Aurora, also an adult nephrologist here at the University of Washington, Allison Everett, our CDE, and also a great nutritionist with a lot of experience with gastroparesis. We have Barbara Uneman, who comes to us from Anne Arundel, Maryland, and is an adult endocrinologist there. We have Lorena Wright, who is the director of our Latinx Diabetes Clinic here at the University of Washington. We have Portia Hong, who's our clinical pharmacist here at the University of Washington. We have Ashley Moss, who's a psychologist and a specialist in diabetes distress, who works both at the Children's Hospital and here at the Diabetes Institute. We also have Katherine Scott Davis, who's our local social worker, who's going to be able to provide us many resources to help our patients living with chronic disease. And then finally, as part of the Diabetes Action Echo Collaborative, we're focusing on patient voices. So I'm gonna let him introduce himself, but the first questions I asked him were about living with diabetes and kidney disease, and then also addressing any barriers that has occurred for him in the healthcare system. So without further ado, take it away. My name is Manoj Srivastav. I was diagnosed with diabetes in 1996, which makes it 26 years I've been living with diabetes. In the last couple of years, other things happened which were new to my health, which is I got a stent, my kidneys started degrading, I guess is the best word. And it seems to me that my body suddenly started falling apart around the start of the pandemic and it seems to be the end stage. I have lived with diabetes for a long time. I have only been with renal disease for about a couple of years. The biggest barriers to managing my diseases has been scheduling. It seems strange, but growing up in a third world country, I could get same day access to my doctors. Here in the United States, usually, unless it's an emergency, you are scheduled two to three months out. And sometimes, the gaps are larger. That has been the hardest to deal with because things change and having access to healthcare in a more agile fashion would have made handling my disease easier. There is no prompting there, but I think he highlights what we're trying to do with the ECHO model so well. Increase access to specialized healthcare. And the idea is that as specialist providers, we can advance that healthcare as long as we help provide the knowledge and empower our patients and you to manage these diseases. So without further ado, Matt, let's go ahead and start our lecture to gain some knowledge. Thanks so much, Nicole, for inviting me to be here today. My disclosure, which is on the next slide, is I don't have anything to disclose, but I am a nephrologist, not an endocrinologist. I will admit what I don't know about endocrinology, but Nicole has really asked me to do a whirlwind tour here through some different aspects of clinical practice guidelines that are at the intersection of kidney disease and diabetes. These are the objectives that we'll cover today. So the first is to talk about what I find has been a very confusing topic for many people, which is what are blood pressure goals in individuals who have diabetes and kidney disease. And we'll review some clinical practice guidelines from some different organizations, including cardiology organizations, diabetes organizations, and kidney disease organizations, each of which have slightly different targets. And I'll try to give my sense of how I think about these when it comes to seeing patients. Secondly, I'll briefly mention kidney protective medications going pretty quickly through, I think, some that you all have covered at length in previous sessions and talk about what I think is a reasonable algorithm for thinking about kidney protective medications in individuals with diabetes and kidney disease. I'll briefly cover nutrition goals, specifically focus on protein intake in individuals with kidney disease. And then at the very end, one or two slides on a new ketis measure for individuals with diabetes. 
First, thinking about blood pressure. Just as background, and I think we all recognize this, but just to bring it up front for everyone, that there is really an enormous burden of comorbid diabetes and hypertension. So this is some estimates from the Global Burden of Disease Project looking across the world at what have been past estimates for the number of individuals living in the world with hypertension and diabetes and what future estimates for growth there are. So this dark red oval here is the number of individuals in 2000 in the world living with hypertension, about a billion individuals. This dark purple circle is the number of individuals living with type 2 diabetes in 2000, about 171 million. And then the expanding ovals are projecting forward to the year 2025, the number of individuals living with hypertension and diabetes, which are 1.5 billion and nearly 400 million respectively. Just to make the point that there is enormous intersection of these two things, approximately 50 to 80% of all individuals with type 2 diabetes have comorbid hypertension. And this number increases the older you get. If you look at individuals over the age of 65 who have diabetes, over 80% are going to have hypertension. In patients with hypertension without diabetes at baseline, about 2% every year do develop diabetes. Getting to the meat of this first objective of the talk today about hypertension treatment targets, I just want to introduce this by acknowledging that the last 10 years have been a really dizzying time for hypertension treatment goals. Going back to 2014, Many of you remember the report from the members of what was the Joint National Committee eighth iteration of the NIH, which released guidelines for targets of blood pressure. And at the time, they proposed that target blood pressure should actually be less than 140 over 90 for anyone less than 60 years of age. And for older folks over age 60, it may be reasonable to actually shoot for a higher blood pressure target of 150 over 90. In 2017, we had this major paradigm shift that I think many of us remember, where really simultaneously guidelines came out for blood pressure from the American College of Cardiology and American Diabetes Association that both lowered thresholds for the definition of hypertension as well as treatment targets, and we'll talk more about that. And then just last year in 2021, KDIGO, which is the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes Initiative, an international guideline organization for kidney disease, actually proposed even lower blood pressure targets for individuals with chronic kidney disease of less than 120 over 80. And we'll talk more about that. This publication is known as the 2017 ACC AHA guidelines for hypertension was incredibly influential. And I just wanted to mention this and in the next slide show the algorithm that this guideline proposed because it really did change the paradigm for blood pressure targets for most individuals, as well as for those with chronic kidney disease. This is really the framework that the guideline proposed. Unlike previous guidelines, which identified normal blood pressure, prehypertension, and hypertension, this guideline proposed thresholds of normal blood pressure, which is less than 120 systolic, a new category of elevated blood pressure of less than 130 millimeters of mercury, but greater than 120, in which non-pharmacologic therapy is recommended. And then hypertension now starting at a threshold systolic blood pressure of 130. Whether or not immediate pharmacologic treatment is recommended is based on an assessment of the patient's 10-year cardiovascular risk score. Anyone who has a 10-year cardiovascular risk of over 10% is recommended to have pharmacologic therapy right away even at a blood pressure of 130 to 139. And this was a real change. And then of course, stage two hypertension, anyone with a systolic blood pressure of over 140. This is the website where you can actually calculate someone's 10-year cardiovascular risk. I just will put this here as a reference for people for the future. I mentioned last year in 2021, this kidney disease organization, KDIGO, released a guideline with even lower blood pressure targets. I just wanted to read the recommendations here for everyone. So the first recommendation focuses on blood pressure measurement, which is a recommendation that everyone use so-called standardized office blood pressure measurement over routine office blood pressure measurement. Okay, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And then the major recommendation here is that in individuals with high blood pressure and chronic kidney disease, that if you use standardized office blood pressure measurement, a blood pressure target 
of a systolic of less than 120 be targeted when tolerated. So just a brief digression to talk about standardized office blood pressure. I'm going to go quickly through this because I understand that you all have talked previously about blood pressure measurement. But just to pick out the important components here of what standardized office blood pressure is, it's really giving patients an adequate time to rest and relax in a quiet room for at least five minutes before measuring blood pressure and using an average of two or more blood pressures rather than a single blood pressure. And of course, all of the other critical elements for blood pressure measurement are still important, including having the back supported, having the right size cuff and the cuff at the heart level. It's important to understand that if you don't do each of these elements, you can get an artifactual increase in blood pressure. And this is a table which sort of states, based on some research, how much blood pressure can rise with each of these factors if it is not done correctly. And then finally, the American Diabetes Association has released guidelines for hypertension in individuals with diabetes that has slightly higher blood pressure targets. So in this case, blood pressure targets are really to shoot for less than 140 over 90 for all individuals. And it is mentioned in the guideline that for individuals with type 2 diabetes and hypertension that are, quote, at higher cardiovascular risk, a blood pressure target of less than 130 over 80 may be appropriate if it can be safely attained. I think most of us would agree that chronic kidney disease does pose a higher cardiovascular risk for patients, and so those patients are included in this category. So I love this picture here, so I'm afraid you've had a paradigm shift. So the question, of course, arises is why are these contemporary blood pressure targets so much lower than what we previously accepted? What data do we have supporting this? I think the answer for at least the American College of Cardiology guidelines, as well as the kidney disease guidelines, really comes down to this one trial, the SPRINT trial, which most of us are familiar with. But just to review, this was a trial published in 2015 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a multi-center randomized trial of over 9,000 patients, importantly, who were not diabetic, who did not have diabetes, and who were over 50 years of age. Then individuals had to have at least some other elevated risk for cardiovascular events, either having had a prior MI, having chronic kidney disease with a GFR of 20 to 60, having a high Framingham risk score or being over age 75. And individuals were randomized to either a, quote, intensive target systolic blood pressure of less than 120 or more of a standard target of less than 140. Individuals were followed forward in time for an outcome of MI, stroke, heart failure, or death from cardiovascular cause. And I think most people are familiar with the results, but it's just this very impressive Kaplan-Meier curve here that shows a dramatic 25% relative risk reduction of that primary outcome. In fact, the trial was stopped early because of the finding that it worked and it was not ethical to continue the trial. So given this amazing finding, why in the diabetes guidelines do we not target a lower blood pressure in all individuals with diabetes? And I apologize for using the word diabetics here because I saw the caution at the beginning of the slides and I'll change this in future, future iterations to individuals with diabetes. But the answer to this question really is uh, the results of a study called the Accord Blood Pressure Trial, which was published actually now over 10 years ago and essentially did the same thing as the SPRINT trial in individuals with diabetes. Randomized individuals with diabetes to a blood pressure of less than 120 versus less than 140. This chart on the left just indicates that they successfully achieved a separation in the blood pressures. But the graph on the right, which is very different than what we saw in the SPRINT trial, is that this was a null finding. So there was no difference in the primary outcome, which is MI, stroke, or death from cardiovascular cause. So here we are, which is the summary of recent blood pressure guidelines. And what you can see is that, number one, all these guidelines do recommend standardized blood pressure measurements. And I know that's been a big focus in prior talks here, and I continue to recommend this as an important focus when I give talks about blood pressure. The systolic blood pressure treatment targets overall tend to be about 130, with the exception of individuals with diabetes, the American Diabetes Association says that individuals at lower cardiovascular risk 
you may actually be okay at tolerating a blood pressure of up to 140 over 90. But in individuals with chronic kidney disease, when using a standardized office blood pressure approach, I will acknowledge that the kidney disease organization suggests you could even think about a blood pressure as low as 120 over 80. So what do I do? What I do is I target a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 for most patients, irrespective of diabetes status. And in individuals with chronic kidney disease, I really focus on using a standardized office blood pressure technique. I use an automated office blood pressure machine, which has a built-in five minute lag period and then averages blood pressures automatically, but you can do this manually as well. And in these individuals, I cautiously lower blood pressure towards 120, but I don't tend to go less than 120. And I do not recommend targeting a systolic blood pressure as low as 120 or lower unless you're using standardized office or reliable home blood pressures. And then finally, in patients who have a systolic blood pressure of less than 130, but the diastolic is greater than 80, given recent focus on systolic blood pressure, I do not further increase antihypertensive agent intensity in these individuals. Let's move on to the second objective now. And that's going to be talking about guidelines around kidney protective medications. First, what are kidney protective medications? And I think this really depends on how you define this. This is what I'm going to focus on. Certainly, the mainstays of therapy for individuals with chronic kidney disease and diabetes, albuminuria for many years, have been the ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. SGLT2 inhibitors, for which there is now lots of evidence regarding kidney benefit. And the GLP-1 agonist, for which there is emerging evidence for kidney benefit, I'm not going to cover in detail today because I understand from Nicole that these have been covered in detail in prior lectures. I'll have brief mention of metformin, and then we'll talk a little bit about mineralic corticoid receptor antagonists, including the three that are available currently in the United States, spironolactone, aplerinone, and a new agent named phenarinone. Just as a kind of reminder to all of us, there is good data on the benefit of RAS inhibition on kidney outcomes in individuals with type 2 diabetes and albuminuria as well as chronic kidney disease. So this is a visual abstract from the Renal study, now from 20 years ago, published in New England Journal of Medicine, where individuals with type 2 diabetes, albuminuria over 300 milligrams per gram of creatinine, and some mild chronic kidney disease were randomized to losartan versus placebo. Importantly, individuals did have hypertension, so these were not normotensive individuals. And then patients were followed forward in time for the primary outcome of doubling of creatinine, death, or kidney failure. The finding, as I'm sure we're all familiar with, was a benefit of angiotensin receptor blockade in this group. Now, you have to go back even further to look for the benefit of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers in individuals without hypertension, but who had diabetes and albuminuria. And that data comes from studies from the mid-1990s looking at captopril. And the outcome there was progression of microalbuminuria to macroalbuminuria. There really has not been good data looking at treating individuals with diabetes and albuminuria with RAS inhibition in the absence of hypertension in the more recent contemporary period. But many of us still do that, and I'm happy to answer questions about that later on. So what about mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists? These are agents that can be used for hypertension, but they also have other effects, including proteinuria lowering. These agents are classically avoided in chronic kidney disease due to risks of hyperkalemia. And for that reason, there's been a lot of interest in developing newer agents that activate the same pathway, but may have less of an impact on potassium levels. So I just wanted to present this one slide about a study called the Fidelio DKD trial. This was published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at the use of this new non-steroidal mineralic corticoid receptor antagonist that potentially, and I'll say potentially, has less hyperkalemia than classic MRAs like spironolactone and aplerinone. I'll note that there have not been comparative effectiveness studies looking at that question, but certainly the developers of this agent would argue that it has less hyperkalemia. Individuals in this study with diabetes and chronic kidney disease were randomized to phenarinone versus placebo for almost three years. The primary outcome was kidney failure, decrease in GFR, 
or death from renal causes, and there was a benefit of this agent. Now, what about less expensive agents that are on the market and have been already for many years? This is just one study that I wanted to highlight in what I would call the emerging literature about the use of MRAs in individuals with chronic kidney disease and diabetes. This was a study that looked at combining an SGLT2 inhibitor, dipagliflozin, with a plerinone, which is an MRA, in individuals with chronic kidney disease and randomized a small number of people, 46 individuals, to one agent or the other or both in a crossover design and found that combining SGLT2 inhibitors and a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist of plerinone was more effective than either alone. So this, again, is what I would call emerging literature, and I think there's a lot more to come on this combination in the future. But putting it together, this is a algorithm that was published with a couple of additions by me here, but this was published recently in Kidney International in the KDGO guidelines for individuals with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. What is the order in which therapy should be added? So of course, lifestyle therapies, physical activity, nutrition, and weight loss are the mainstays of therapy, but first learned pharmacologic agents are metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors. I have added ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers if individuals are hypertensive. So why metformin? Well, this is not because of a clear benefit on kidney outcomes, but it is obvious due to its low cost, low risk of hypoglycemia, preventing weight gain, reducing cardiovascular events, et cetera, et cetera, that this agent remains first line. If additional agents are needed after these two for glycemic control, then GLP-1 receptor agonist is listed as the preferred agent, and then others based on patient preference, comorbidities, cost, and other factors. I will note here that MRAs are not yet in the guidelines, but that I think that we're going to see more of this in the upcoming years. In the last five to eight minutes here, objectives, we're going to move on to new nutrition goals for those with kidney disease. But just very briefly on this, and this is from a recent clinical practice guideline from an organization called KDOKI, which is basically an arm of the National Kidney Foundation. In its 2020 update on nutrition, this is what it states. It states in adults with chronic kidney disease stages three to five, which is going to be a GFR of 15 to 60, who are metabolically stable, we recommend protein restriction to reduce the risk for end-stage kidney disease, and this is a 2C recommendation. In addition, in adults with chronic kidney disease stages three to five and diabetes, they say it is reasonable under close supervision to have a dietary protein intake of 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. And this is an opinion, right? So basically based on no evidence. And then obviously sodium restriction in individuals with kidney disease as well. So why limit protein in individuals with chronic kidney disease? What's the physiologic rationale for this? Well, the rationale is that an excess load of amino acids is known to increase intraglomerular pressure by dilating the inflow of blood to the glomerulus. And that may increase the amount of proteinuria that can occur in individuals with chronic kidney disease and potentially lead to worsened chronic kidney disease. Therefore, if you restrict protein, you reverse this process and actually constrict the afferent arterial in the nephron. What are some concerns about this? One concern is about patients adhering or really being willing to tolerate a low protein diet. It's not clear that this is really acceptable to very many individuals. It can require a trained dietitian to really develop an individualized program. In many places, registered dietitians are not universally available to do this. I think a bigger point, to be honest, is the effectiveness. So in this same guideline in which it recommended this, it also said the certainty of evidence is low or very low, right? It's possible, though not yet unequivocally proved, that nutritional interventions like protein restriction slow disease progression. And in particular, in individuals with diabetes and chronic kidney disease, there are really no studies cited that show that low protein diets are effective. What do I do in my approach? I actually recommend a normal protein diet for my patients, and I don't have a different recommendation for patients with or without diabetes. So that means in individuals who are eating a steak every day, I tell them to cut it out, but I don't tell people to really restrict protein substantially. And of course, low salts diets for individuals with proteinuria and hypertension. I do not recommend dietary phosphate restriction in general. Finally, Nicole asked me to briefly mention this new two-test HEDIS kidney health evaluation for individuals with diabetes screening measure. 
So what is HEDIS? HEDIS is the Healthcare Effectiveness Data Information Set. It's a comprehensive set of standardized performance measures designed to evaluate health plans, and it has a focus on preventative care. In 2020, a new measure was released related to kidney health evaluation. It's called the KED measure, and it's part of the HEDIS measurement year 2022. So what is the measure? The measure basically is the percentage of adults ages 18 to 85 with either type 1 or type 2 diabetes that have been assessed with an estimated GFR and a urine albuminocratine ratio in the last 12 months. And this is called the kidney profile. Why this change? Why not do what we've been doing for a long time, which is focusing on assessment of microalbuminuria in this patient population? What I will say is this new measure was developed with extensive partnership with the National Kidney Foundation, and it's really aimed at earlier diagnosis. And it's based on statistics that seem to indicate that historically, less than 50% of individuals with diabetes have had their estimated GFR in albuminuria both assessed in the last year. Now, this doesn't seem to mesh with my personal experience at UW, but this is what national data would suggest. And so I think a lot more individuals in our patient population probably have both of these things done. I think what has changed since in 2012, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force said it's not worth checking creatinine on everyone as a screening measure. I think what's different now is what we've already discussed, which is the availability of more, quote, kidney protective medications, including SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonists, and increasingly MRAs. And so I think the idea now is if you identify individuals with type 2 diabetes who have CKD early, we, this now actually changes management and can reduce adverse kidney outcomes. What have I talked about today in this whirlwind tour? We've talked about clinical guidelines about blood pressure targets in individuals with and without diabetes and that they're confusing. And that my recommendation that a goal blood pressure of less than 130 over 80 is pretty reasonable for most patients. We're in a new era of kidney protective medications with individuals with CKD and especially for diabetes and CKD. So metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors for most. ACE inhibitors and ARBs for hypertensive patients, GLP-1 agonists of additional glycemic control is needed. And then we've talked a little bit about this emerging area of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. And that I would say protein restriction in CKD remains controversial even amongst nephrologists. So Nicole, I'll turn things back to you. That's pretty much all that I have. And you can tell us what the next steps are. Thank you, Matt. That was a great summary and just some great pearls. Something that came up in the question and answer was, how often are you finding people are symptomatic, so lightheaded dizziness in your clinical practice, and you actually have to target higher blood pressure goals because of symptoms? So in my experience, I think when automated office blood pressure or some sort of standardized office blood pressure technique is used, where you're really removing some white coat component or other artifactual increases. I'm not finding a huge amount of orthostasis in targeting somewhat lower blood pressures. I do think that's a real concern if you're using a sort of conventional office blood pressure technique, but I do think it can happen in anyone. So it is very important to follow patients, ask how they're doing. Ultimately, if someone is having poor quality of life because of orthostasis, that's going to trump any lower blood pressure target from some research study. Great point there. And I always say, I'm always really nervous on that petite, frail, older woman, but sometimes I've had to put hydrochlorothiazide on for calcium reduction in the urine, and they seem to tolerate it pretty well. So I'm actually surprised how resilient, or maybe just the aging process that really supports the blood pressure as well. It looks like David Johnson has a question. Go ahead, David. Thank you. So my question was basically for patients with albuminuria and no hypertension. I just wanted clarification. Is there a role for pharmacological management in those patients or not? I'll give my answer and then I'm interested in what others think. And maybe Dr. Aurora can give his thoughts about that as well. So the Renal study was in individuals with hypertension. So from that study, it doesn't answer the question of whether ACEs and ARBs are valuable in individuals with albuminuria without hypertension. The data on the role of RAS inhibition in individuals with albuminuria and without hypertension comes from older studies from the 90s looking at Captopril. And I think we all sort of extrapolate that to using these agents to try to reduce 
albuminuria in individuals, even if they have normal blood pressures, if we can sneak on a little dose of ACE inhibitor or ARB, but I'll acknowledge that the data is not good actually for that approach, even though many of us do that. Nan, do you have any thoughts about that or anyone else? Yeah, I do this routinely. If there is albuminuria present, even in the absence of hypertension, I will try to add on a low dose of a angiotensin receptor blocker or an ACE inhibitor. As Dr. Varra mentioned, the, the data for this is not good. There's subgroup analyses and all the issues that come with looking at data that way that support that. That being said, it's more opinion-based at this point. I do this routinely. The other thing to think about is many of these patients will have heart failure or other things that necessitate these medications in the absence of heart failure. So something to think about as well. Great points. I think another teaching point is that in the absence of microalbuminuria and hypertension as a preventative measure, there isn't really evidence for use of the ACE or the ARB. And I see it a lot in my type 1 population, especially because they tend to have longer duration of diabetes. But there is no real clear evidence without one or the other as well. We could keep this discussion going, but I do want to get to our case today. So I'm going to ask Jenny, our case presenter, to go ahead and take it away. The case I picked was a patient of mine here. I have a little bit of details that's different from this page, but Basically, it's a 69-year-old female. She has a long-standing history of uncontrolled diabetes, insulin dependence that's been complicated by CKD stage 3A, GFR 55, some neuropathy, recurrent gastroparesis, which has been formally diagnosed with a gastric emptying study with GI, as well as hypertension and recurrent pancreatitis, for which she ends up hospitalized a lot for. A lot of the main issues for kind of the discussion of her case specifically was that her A1C has been upward trending over the years, mostly because she's in the hospital so often. She's great when she's inpatient, and when she leaves, she's very discouraged or loses her momentum. And so her A1C often is around 12 to 14 percent. And usually without the momentum, there's a little bit less engagement with nutrition. And then for a while, she has these periods where she'll be great with medication. And then there'll be some kind of barrier that comes up like financial costs, prior off, or just pain being her primary concern, or just insurance stopping coverage of a medication she's been using for over a year that leads to this, her dropping off in terms of medication adherence. So her current regimen right now is the Lantus that she has been injecting nightly at 17 units, Tenolog about 10 with breakfast and lunch, 15 with dinner, like Sinopril 20 for her blood pressure. Most recently, she'd been checking her glucose about four times a day. We tried to get her these Freestyle Libre monitors that she got a free two-month trial with, and she had two more free sensors, but it's been very spotty on whether or not she can scan, and she's complaining about a lot of issues with the check and beeping. And then other meds that we had tried unsuccessfully with this, with titrations, is she can't be on metformin anymore just because it causes diarrhea, abdominal pain whenever she takes it. She has felt like it's usually been like the nidus that led to her rehospitalization to then be re-diagnosed with a gastroparesis flare. With her history of gastroparesis and pancreatitis, she's not really the great candidate at all for a GLP-1 receptor agonist. I recognize that she's not on an SGLT2 inhibitor, and actually that was an insurance issue for a while. I haven't really been able to follow up with all the denials, but that was something that we were considering as well. More recently, after a really significant hospitalization, she's been a lot more motivated, especially since her mom had passed away within the last couple of years of complications of diabetes, that she's been able to follow up more regularly. Her A1C has gone from 14% in February to most recently 9.8, which is still above goal, but that's where we've been in the last week or so. From the next page, this is just a little bit more of her demographic from her last clinical exam, which was the end of August. She most recently is around 160 pounds. Her BPs have always been around the 120s and 70s. It's been well within the goal. And her recent blood work showed that she had a random glucose around 170, which kind of correlates to her glucose check. Her A1C was 9.8, like I mentioned. And then her cholesterol, her LDL is 99. And then the rest of her labs you can see in front of you. But generally, her fasting glucose is around 190s to 220s based on what she could upload for her glucometer and her freestyle libre. And her one-hour postprandials are usually around the 150s, is what she told me a week ago. That's just her care gaps and everything for primary care. She's getting her foot checks. She's getting her retinal exams and everything. And mentioned her barriers, which is mix of transportation and just access to medication and insurance limitations to what we can prescribe her. Anything you want to highlight about her nutrition? I know you had that 24-hour recall on her. 
Yeah, this was the latest check-in with nutrition, which was about two weeks ago when she felt like she was doing great. And so you look like she's made a lot of modifications. She used to eat a lot of prepackaged food and a lot more carb heavy. So you can just scan her breakfast, lunch, and dinner. She frequently has fruit with most meals. And then there's often some kind of carb, like a bread, a bagel, or toast, or multiple types of carbs, and even her wraps or tortillas and everything. And so she generally still has a pretty carb heavy meal. And she's slowly trying to shift that more towards a little bit more protein, less carbs, and more vegetables. But before, she was drinking a non-dietary soda almost every day. She was eating a lot of candy at midnight when she'd wake up with cravings and everything. And so this was a couple of weeks ago, but the, even this has been changed. It has been improving in the last couple of weeks as well. So I would imagine her A1C is continuing to improve. Great presentation and a very interesting case. So Allison, as our nutritionist in CD, do you have a clarifying question for Jenny? Yes. And I guess I don't have very much time to do this. So you have a diagnosis of gastroparesis and if it's mild to moderate, actually salads, raw vegetables are some of the most difficult foods for people with gastroparesis to be able to digest. I love that she's going to a nutritionist, but just making sure that your nutritionist CMAR looks at the hallmark principles, which is low fiber. And it's a mind bender for people with diabetes because we've been telling them for years to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, but with the gastroparitic stomach, those are the most difficult things to eat. And I always say, if you have trouble chewing it, you're going to have trouble digesting it. So the low fiber is really important. Small, frequent meals. It looks like she's eating three meals per day. And then coordination of the meal and the insulin dose. Some of our patients have to actually take their mealtime insulin after they finish eating to see if they can get the whole meal in. Sometimes they look at the meal before they take their insulin and then wind up going low. And that's one of the things that I always ask patients in terms of if it's been a while since they had a gastric emptying stomach study, but patients that come in and say they have bad burps, that's a good thing to keep track of. And then if they're vomiting in the morning after after a meal from the night before, and it looks undigested. Those are two things that I always ask patients if they have bad burps, and then if they throw up food, does it look semi-undigested? Those are great points for clarifying questions. Like what specific symptoms is she having related to the gastroparesis and how often is it occurring? In terms of those symptoms, her last big hospitalization was probably late May, and the way she generally classically presents to our service is she thinks it's initially food poisoning or something, and she ate something, and she starts vomiting, and then it becomes intractable, like nonstop vomiting, and then the onset of abdominal pain that she can't manage at home, and then she just can't keep anything, and she's getting dehydrated, so then she'll eventually go to the ED for pain management rehydration and another follow-up with the nutritionist there as well to try to get the ball rolling in terms of planning and what she should be doing from a nutrition standpoint as well. Yeah, and I'm not a huge advocate of smoothies for people with diabetes, but people with gastroparesis, it's a great way for them to get vegetables in and things. And it's, you have your magic bullet at home and it's really easy to count those carbs and figure out the insulin doses. These people tend to do better with carbohydrate counting versus set doses. When I looked at her, it was like 10, 10, and 15. That would be something that perhaps with your dietitian. And I just wanted to say to Matthew Rivieras, yes, as a dietitian working with people with diabetic kidney disease, we tend to not restrict protein, but give recommendations for the same amount of protein that he did as well, because we find a lot of times if we get too restricted with people with diabetes, they wind up getting malnutrition. I have a couple of questions. I saw that she had a screening for eye disease, but does she have retinopathy or neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy? She has some peripheral neuropathy that she's on low-dose gabapentin for, but her retinal screens are often normal, like all of one year. And the reason I ask, because I find that I tend to be really careful when I diagnose patients with diabetic gastroparesis, because... There is really not much treatment, so I always want to make sure that I'm not missing something else. It is a very rare complication. It's a late complication of diabetes, so it's usually not common to have gastroparesis when they don't have other complications. So it might be, I would rule other things out, something that 
potentially could have a treatment and it won't have a, such an impact on how we manage the diabetes. Like it could, I don't know, something else, but it does sound like she had pancreatitis or some sort of GI disorder that might affect the GI system. And it might not necessarily be diabetic neuropathy or gastroparesis. And Lorena, that's a great point. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go into the case notes and delve into this patient's background a little bit more. I'm just going to move forward. We always do a recap at the beginning. So we know this patient is a 69-year-old patient with uncontrolled type 2 diabetes, likely complicated by peripheral neuropathy, CKD3A, with a GFR of about 55, some mild proteinuria with microalbumin creatinine ratio at 30, and she's had recurrent pancreatitis, and she has this possible gastroparesis, although you reported that she did have confirmed gastric emptying study, and so it's definitely more possible. She also has hypertension and hyperlipidemia for her cardiovascular risk factors. EMI is 29, and her absolute weight is 73 kilograms. Right now, we believe her diabetes is uncontrolled with an A1C of high nines, her most recently. She's having, it sounds like not so much daily abdominal pain, but perhaps recurrent cyclic vomiting and abdominal pain that leads to recurrent hospitalizations. And it was mentioned in the notes that she's maybe not as engaged with her healthcare system in between these hospitalizations, and then there may be some costs for medications. You can see here her med list just for everyone to remember it. We already went over her individual characteristics, but with a BMI of 29, she's probably more likely insulin resistant. She does have some renal insufficiency, which is going to affect how we use her medications. And her insurance, to point out, is Medicare, and she does have some comorbidities. When we see a person living with diabetes, the first thing we ask ourselves is what type of diabetes do they have? Or not what type, but do they make insulin or are they relatively insulinopenic or do they not make any insulin? In this person's case, we still believe that potentially she has type 2 diabetes, which means she has more resistance component to it. Because of her chronic pancreatitis, though, she may be relatively insulinopenia. Barbara, our endocrinologist, I'm going to ask you, would you draw a C-peptide, which is a marker of her endogenous insulin in this patient? And if so, why? I don't think I will because I don't think it will change my management in this person. But in other patients, sometimes I will draw a C-peptide. For this particular person, I think we already are treating the patient with insulin and we have some information that limits us with using other non-insulin agents like GLPs. So getting a C-peptide will not change my management, and I usually don't order a test if I'm not going to do anything with the results. In general, when that question comes up, I sometimes would check a C-peptide to check to see if somebody doesn't make insulin and if we should be switching them or adding insulin on. I agree 100% with that statement because... Right now, when I look at her primary diabetes medications is going to be insulin. So I do not think I would check a C-peptide as well. Our second question we always ask is, what is our A1C goal? I'm going to throw that out to Lorena, our other endocrinologist. What goal A1C do you want to get her to? I think because it, she's had this high A1C for a while, and I do want her to be motivated I would celebrate a small victories, like the fact that she brought it down from 14 to 10. I would say that's great. And then I would have small goals to target A1C. Maybe the next visit, uh, the last one was 10, right? If it's eight, I would be really happy, but I would just, ideally, as long as they don't have hypoglycemia, really is as low as they can go, especially it, she doesn't seem to have major complications and I'm still wondering about the gastroparesis. So that's how I would do it. Great point. And I thought seven to seven and a half over time would be an okay target for her over a duration. But I also was thinking maybe eight would be okay for her given her age and her comorbidities. Barbara, would you still target seven to seven and a half over a long period of time if we can get there? Or would you be happy with eight? I think seven and seven to seven and a half is great because she hasn't had a heart attack or stroke that was mentioned to us and she doesn't have high risk of hypoglycemia. She has stage three kidney disease. So a seven to seven and a half is good. So we're all in agreement on that as well. That's great. 
Now we're going to focus a little bit on our non-pharmacological intervention. And we already got some great pearls from Allison about management in gastroparesis. What I wanted to highlight first is that what we first have to do is really establish the diagnosis of gastroparesis is what Lorena mentioned. And she did have that gastric emptying study. But sometimes in the setting of uncontrolled diabetes, which is where this patient has been with A1Cs above 10 and as high as 14, you actually get decrease in peristalsis and a gut motility. And so the study may not be as valid. We may want to repeat that gastric emptying study once we're able to manage her diabetes better. We do have to keep that in the back of our mind. And we've talked about some of these great pearls for what to do for gastroparesis and how to adjust their meals. I cringe as an endocrinologist when I think about limiting fiber, but we can always target and use insulin to manage those higher glycemic index foods if that's what's needed. But I was hoping Allison could also comment on pancreatitis and recurrent pancreatitis, what dietary modifications you would focus on that in case that can be part of her abdominal pain and cyclic vomiting cycle. Every patient is so different and just talking to them and sometimes when people are vomiting and their electrolytes and everything's all messed up and they start and they can't stop and they have to go and get fluids and such. But often when we'd see these patients, depending on the degree, sometimes we had to put them on like a elemental formula just to give their system a complete rest because all our nutrients are going to cause us to release enzymes to help us break down all the macronutrients, just depending on the degree, but definitely probably the lower fat foods would be a really good. And once again, with the vomiting, liquids are more easy to throw up than solids for. So if we don't know if it's the gastroparesis or the pancreatitis, the lower fats, probably more liquid foods would be what I would definitely suggest for this patient. I think that's a great thing since, especially because a lot of times we're supposed to target less fatty foods with gastroparesis and with pancreatitis, maybe start there and see how she does and then keep adding on more of the gastroparesis instructions if potentially she has more symptoms, just limiting the fat. And that would be an empiric trial where we're waiting to see if her peristalsis improves with improved glycemic control. That might be a situation where you might use something like glucerna or something like that. But also just for if somebody really has severe gastroparesis, actually empty liquids empty more easily than solids. So if it is gastroparesis and not pancreatitis, we do often recommend more some, you can tolerate more fats because you to add calories. So the person doesn't become malnourished. So you just highlighted how complex it is, right? So limit fat or needs more fat to maintain our nutrition. That's the balance that we're all working for. And it's great if you have your nutritionist insight as well to work on this with the patient. Then the next question that sort of came up was the cost of her medications, especially in our Medicare population. And I'm wondering, Jenny, what was the biggest limitation for her medications? Was it the insulin? Was it the insulin sparing agents? Tell us a little bit more about that. And then we'll ask the social worker to comment on any resources for that. She had been on the pen for a while and then randomly in the middle of the year, her insurance decided to not cover the specific pens that she had both the short acting and long acting. And so they're like, we need a prior auth and she had to go back to the vials so that really threw things off because she was very unmotivated with the vials. And then there was like two or three appeals. And when I was about to submit the fourth one, they finally said, oh, okay, we've decided to cover them again. Then she got back on the medication. That was in the four month period of after the hospitalization, having all these different vials, being confused by their medications and sometimes using them not the best. And then I feel like it's hit or miss with insurance. Sometimes I try to do like, if we try to talk about parting guardians, for example, it's 50, 50 and some insurance is cover or the copay is like 80 bucks or something insane for patients. Or sometimes they say go with Invocana instead. But then for both, they actually did not cover either. And she doesn't have any extra income at the end of the month to add on this medication at this time. It would basically be asking her to stop one of her insulins and she didn't want to do that. And obviously it was not a great option. And then similarly, like her wanting to go down on her glucometers because checking four times a day is a little bit cumbersome. So we tried to see if she would qualify for monitors and we had a pharmaceutical rep that gave her a two month supply. But then when she tried to pick it up through her insurance, it's telling her that it will cost $80 a month for two sensors, which is also cost prohibitive. 
Got it. So I'm going to call on our social worker. Any resources, particularly for our older aging population on Medicare with or without Medicare D and different types of Medicare Part D? Can you comment on resources to help with medication costs? Yeah, so a couple of things that I will just call out is there are some of these discount programs, King County, the state reference that I can provide a list of some of these programs that will provide some reduced cost medication. So that might be one way. Another service that's available is a programs that will assist patients in connecting to patient assistance programs. So many of the drug manufacturers have these patient assistance programs in which you could qualify for either free or highly reduced medications, but sometimes they're kind of complicated. So you can apply for those through the manufacturer, but they also have some organizations that will work with patients to see if they can connect them with a program to assist in that way. So I think in this particular case, that would be a couple of areas. There also are, depending on the entity that they are receiving their care through, sometimes financial assistance programs can assist with medications depending on the particular entity and what their financial assistance covers. So that might be a couple areas to explore to see if there's some assistance in that way. And then the other question I had for you that might not be specific for this patient, because food insecurity doesn't seem to be one of her issues. Tell us about some senior programs, maybe if they're specific to being diabetes friendly or that you would sometimes recommend to your patients who are struggling preparing their food or just with food insecurity, getting food on the table. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is an area where there's some pretty good resources in our community. One particular organization that just has a couple of options is called Sound Generations. They do support this particular geriatric population. Two of the programs they have is a Meals on Wheels type of model in which food can be delivered. But they also have connections to community dining options where somebody can go. They can also then maybe be getting out of the house, engaging with others, having that social connection. Then there are also some programs that are some, and just to note, many of these either community dining and Meals on Meals programs will offer specific diets if individuals need that. It depends on their location and which program they go through. There's also some of these sort of farmer's market nutrition type programs where you can get fruits and vegetables. And some of those are you go to, some of those that can be delivered to you. Sound Generations does a pretty good job of having those all in one place, but you can just call to and one and the person can say where they live and they can help connect them to the actual programs available within their actual community. Great suggestions there. It is great to see that our region is stepping up a little bit to combat food insecurity and hopefully provide more healthful food for people, especially as they age. So great points there. Going on to my next clinical question that came up in your discussion as well, Jenny, was First, it sounds like she haven't been able to access her CGM data. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you did say that in the morning, sugar's in the 200s is what she's reported to you, but her postprandials are in the 150s. Is that correct? Yeah, you're nodding your head. But we haven't actually seen a report. Sometimes I spend most of my visit setting up their data for remote monitoring. So then the next time I can actually do more care. Then the other thing I heard was that it was alarming. I'm assuming overnight when she was having highs. So this idea of alarm fatigue. And so just to briefly comment on it, there are very simple handouts that both of the main CGM device companies can provide that tell you how to do it. This one's specific to our Freestyle Libra 2, but Dexcom also has a step-by-step -step instructions as well for their CGM. It is just spending the time walking people through on the phone, and a lot of it is having this cord to connect to the computer and then having computer access, which they might have to go to the library for. If you have lost your cord, you can call the customer service and they'll send you another one. And I have found that's been one of the big limitations. So they just might not even have the cord. And then uh, and Nicole, this is Allison. You can yeah. buy a cord. It's a micro USB cord on Amazon for less than like $3.99. So it's, it might be easier than contacting the company. That is a great point as well. I didn't actually know there was a universal cord, but if for older population, if they feel comfortable doing that, they can definitely do that as well. The other thing is that the older freestyle version did not have alarms, but the newer freestyle Libra 2 has alarms and the default alarms are set to be 240 for high and 70 for low, but you can actually change those or you can turn off. So I actually think that might be the most beneficial thing for the patient is until we can control her overnight sugars to keep that 
high alert off so that she does get some more restful sleep. And this is where I'm going to get Ashley, our psychologist, to talk a little bit about diabetes, distress, and monitoring and monitoring fatigue. So go ahead, Ashley. I can't overemphasize how important thinking about where the alarms and the levels are set up for patients in terms of fatigue and diabetes distress and how that contributes. On top of that, sometimes some patients benefit from just having planned technology vacations where they know when it's going to happen and they can say, okay, this is the time where I'm going to do finger sticks and I'm going to plan for four times. Oftentimes when we just say and wait for, I'm done, I'm over it and take off the CGM and then don't have a backup plan for transitioning back to finger sticks. It's a really vulnerable period. And so if she gets to that point where she's feeling really fatigued by that and you have that conversation, I would talk to her about a planned technology vacation. If it ends up being still a little too much to be on the CGM, going back on the finger sticks, that's the option for her kind of navigating what are the major barriers to her actually using it. I heard you say that it's just been really hard and burdensome. And so I'll talk with a lot of patients about how do you structure it? What's getting in the way? What's been the hardest part? And figuring out are there things that she can connect it to that are happening consistently throughout the day? Are there people in her life that can help support her doing this? And thinking about how to structure her environment to help her be more successful. I did want to comment really briefly on one thing in terms of diabetes distress is there is a scale called the diabetes distress scale. It's got some really great questions on there that can help guide further conversation with patients about different areas of distress when it comes to diabetes. They have a four different ones. There's emotional burden of diabetes, regimen related distress, and then interpersonal distress related to those relationships with people in their lives. And there's another one about physician related distress that can be really helpful. It gives a total score and each for each of those domains. But what I really like is looking at those individual questions to guide conversation, get some clarification about what's so distressing for patients. One of the things that I think is really important that I heard you talk about is that she has this nice bounce back after hospitalization, this increase in motivation. And oftentimes what we see is this big burst of motivation and then either patients either kind of fall off a cliff or they peter down in terms of their motivation. So I would want to talk with her about what are the things that have helped her get through periods of stress, normalizing the fluctuation and change, and especially A1C and maintaining dietary changes and physical activity and really focusing on strengths-based conversations and interventions. What are the things that have helped you before? What are your main motivators? It's likely that her mother's complications and passing from the complications of diabetes are not going to maintain her motivation long-term. So really focusing in on the things that are right now, what are motivating for her that are more closely aligned with her current values and not just being driven by her mother's death, because that doesn't necessarily give her something to be more active upon. I think the other piece with eating that I will just throw out there is sometimes what we see is patients getting into a pattern of restriction with food, and that's where they do the quote unquote sneaking. And we see these for people of all ages when it comes to eating and food choices. So allowing for some honoring and permission of having those foods rather than feeling like she has to satisfy those cravings in the middle of the night. And so maybe it's like giving yourself permission to have a soda during the week or having some candy during the week and having it be planned so it doesn't have to be potentially shaming or being guilt-driven or emotion-driven. Such great points. And it's going to tie into our next slide very well. Additionally, she's someone, because cost is an issue for CGM, I would definitely maybe want to be using it as we're picking our medication choices and to see patterns, but she could do two weeks on, two weeks off if cost is an issue, because then it's only $30 to $40 a month, which again can be cost prohibitive to many people, but maybe more doable than $70 to $80 a month for the whole month of sensors. This goes into our next discussion, which is about insulin and medication management for this patient. Because of her abdominal pain and some of her other complications and comorbidities, right now, insulin is the correct choice for her. So the first thing I always do is think about her based on her weight and her degree of kidney function. What background insulin or basal insulin would I be comfortable with? The average type 2 patient with a BMI of above 28 to 35 or 40 
probably needs between 0.2 and 0.5 units per kilogram of background insulin. For her, probably 0.25 to 0.3 units of insulin per kilogram is probably a good background dose of insulin. Right now she's on 17 units of insulin, which is about 0.23 units per kilogram. So given that what we're hearing is a rise of her blood sugar overnight, it might be appropriate to go up to the 22 units. However, this is not the patient because we couldn't get her data, but what we're always worried about is what is actually going on overnight. What you see on this January 28th tracing is that they actually are low and then by the morning they have a rebound high. So it might look high because they were low overnight. You see the variability, so there really isn't a pattern. If she's snacking overnight, the first thing you may want to target is addressing insulin use for that snack before bedtime rather than just going up on the background insulin. In her case, I think a safe dose to escalate to would be up to 22 units of background insulin if we see a pattern of rise overnight despite being in a fasting state. Then the next thing is, what about her perennial mealtime insulin? And again, also you're thinking about fractional or sensitivity. Sensitivity is if you give one unit of insulin, what you predict your blood sugar to drop by. Right now, she's on 35 units daily of her mealtime insulin, and that's about 0.3 units per kilogram. So that's a good dose. And you have already mentioned that her postprandials actually seem okay. Less than 180 is the goal by the American Diabetes Association. And a more strict goal is two hours after for the ACE guidelines, which is our American Academy of Clinical Endocrinologists, less than 140. So she's meeting those goals, but her A1C is 10 or high nines. And that doesn't actually really match with what you're telling me her average blood sugars are. So I definitely would want to wait another month or two or three months and repeat her A1C to see if it is matching. But I would definitely go more by what her current CGM data is and the average there. Because I suspect that maybe she has some inaccuracy of her A1C based on what you're telling me her glucose patterns are. So it's something to think about. And then we predict that one unit of insulin will drop her about 30 points. So you take the total daily dose of insulin, which is about 52 units, and then you divide it by 1,700. Some people use 1,500. Some people use 1,800. I tend to use 1,700. And basically, that means one unit will drop her about 30 points. If that's too complicated to add, then sometimes I'll just say two units for greater than 200, because that should drop her to 140, four units for greater than 260, and then greater than 300, six units, so that it's a much simpler thought process and much less math calculation. That all depends on the patient's education level. And what they're able to do and how often they're able to monitor their blood sugars. The very first thing I do think we need to ask is, especially because we hear these patterns of being motivated and unmotivated, is what are the barriers for her taking her insulin on a regular basis? And how do we ask about taking insulin and not shaming her about snacking or doing higher sugar foods in a non-judgmental way, but finding out what her patterns are? So this is where I'm going to use the patient voice again, because I think even though it's not specific to insulin, he talks a little bit about how his healthcare providers support him. So I'm going to go ahead and start that now. One of the issues that I faced over my long stint with the disease is every few years or so I fall off the wagon. Usually it happens at family gatherings. It's really hard to maintain a proper diet when you are meeting large family gatherings. And I have diabetes. I have cardiovascular disease. I have a stent. And now renal disease. This usually means that I can't eat anything at my usual family gatherings. So I fall off the wagon. I'm not proud of it, but it happens. It has often been very useful the way my diabetes healthcare team has stepped in proactively, tried to figure out innovative solutions for helping me manage my disease. For example, I was turned on to Eversense, which they embed a continuous glucose monitor. You know, and this was not on my horizon. Even though I am a technology enthusiast, I hadn't thought about that, didn't know about that. That really helped me manage my diabetes. This is not just one, but several of my diabetes specialists have reached out 
when I have fallen off the wagon and without judgment, which is the thing that scared me about going back, help me get back on track. My kidney doctor noticed that I was uh, anemic and I had protein in my bloodstream, reached out for a consult to see if it was multiple myeloma. Thankfully, it was not. But in retrospect, I appreciated that. This is going beyond the usual, okay, let's have you in, manage your disease. This is looking forward to see what else could be going on. And you can see how it was so important for him to be supported by his healthcare team, but be able to share with them some of the barriers that were occurring so they could support him in his successes. So I just thought we really want to do that, especially in our patients using insulin. And I thought his voice really highlighted that. The other thing is we have all this technology available. How can we support this person who is taking multiple doses of insulin a day? One thing I think a lot of us as endocrinologists have been using for our patients on intensive insulin therapy is something called the InPen. And what it is, is an app that can track the dose. It actually links to your iPhone if it's compatible and you can pair it with your continuous glucose monitoring device. And so you do get all that data. You get the insulin, you get what the blood sugars are, and it's all in a nice report that you can look at with your patient. And it's very easy to set up those things we were talking about. You can set it up as carb counting or a set dose of insulin this person is on, so 10, 10, and 15. And then you can set a target glucose, what you predict them to need to reduce their blood sugar. And then it makes a calculation and gives them a suggested dose of insulin to take before the meal. And then it records it for you. And you can see here how it's nicely set up to do those calculations for them. So sometimes that does help with the fatigue. And it also helps you see, as you can see with this report, you can see the total daily dose of insulin. So if they're supposed to be taking about 52 units of insulin a day, but they're actually taking... 30, then you know there's some barriers for them taking their insulin. The other thing that I really like on this report is actually they show the mean average decline in your fasting blood sugar overnight. So if it declines more than 30 points, you probably are on too much background insulin. In this patient's case, if it rises more than 30 points overnight, you'll know this person needs more background insulin. I really like how this person summarizes it. For these medical devices that we're talking about, one thing we found is there's a specialty pharmacy called Alto that helps navigate these devices for the patient and make sure they're accessible and they can tell them the cost up front if there is anything additionally for them. The InPen is still going to be a pen and it's going to be multiple doses of insulin that you have to take along with them. I thought this was actually a great case to highlight our patch insulin devices. And so one of them is our Vigo. And basically it develops an hourly unit of insulin. So like 20 units of basal, 30 and 40. And then each click you delivers two units of insulin. So basically you can give yourself meal time and have the background insulin in a patch that you use every 24 hours. That might not be a bad thing for the patient. However, if you see the limitation of the Vigo is that the prandial can only go up to 36 units. And this person is already on 35 a day. A lot of people need a lot more prandial insulin. So she may need actually more of that. So that might be a limitation. The actual device I was thinking for this patient was this newer device called Secure. It's just an insulin patch that's really tiny and it get, delivers up to 200 units of insulin over a three-day period. Whereas the Vigo, you have to change out every 24 hours. This one is nice because you can wear it for three days at a time and it holds up to 200 units of insulin. And so I actually thought about this for this patient. If she wanted to have some chocolate in the evening or at bedtime, she could just click her little insulin patch and she could be delivered that insulin for her snack without really being shamed by it, but also having the insulin accessible and be around when she's having their craving. So I do think if it's not cost prohibitive, given what we've heard about some of our other issues, it would be a beneficial device. And the nice thing is it is vials of insulin. So again, vials of insulin tend to be a little bit cheaper than the pens themselves. And definitely we can give Jenny a resource so she can look into the cost if the patient's interested in something like that. Those are just some of the novel technologies that we have available that may make insulin more accessible to the patient without disrupting their daily day. 
I think about this for our labor workers as well, where when they're out on their job site, they might be able to click when they're eating their meal. Typically, a lot of the meals are heavier when you're working outside in the heat and everything. I did want to get back to this question of what about insulin sparing agents? and use of medications and gastroparesis for pain management. I'm gonna ask this to Matt first. So this patient's on 20 milligrams of lisinopril. Do you think there's any added benefit to maximizing her to 40 or are you okay given her blood pressure and her microalbuminuria or keeping her on 20 of her ACE? It's a good question. I think most folks would probably maximize the ACE and R before like to quote maximally tolerated dose prior to adding an SGLT2 inhibitor, and certainly prior to adding an MRA. Interpretation of what's a maximum tolerated dose, I think probably may differ from physician to physician, but I think if you're not getting orthostatic symptoms and no acute kidney injury, probably maximizing that may be of greater benefit. And I'm going to throw this out to Nyan. Let's say we maximize her to 40 of lisinopril, her blood pressure is being maintained, do you think in the setting of microalbuminuria at 30, there is clear benefit for adding SGLT2 inhibitor? Well, SGLT2 inhibitor, yes, we know there's clear benefit in adding it. That being said, the studies that have been done used a urine albumin creatinine ratio greater than 200. The reason I say there is going to be benefit is that EMPA kidney completed early. It hasn't been published yet. It'll be published and reported in November, but they looked at patients with or without diabetic kidney disease and irregardless of urine albumin creatinine ratio. So that's something that is going to be upcoming. What's more important is that with albuminuria, you're at higher cardiovascular risk and SGLT2 inhibitors are going to improve that. That's the technical answer. Practically, I probably wouldn't do any of those for this particular patient. The reason is her risk of progression of kidney disease is extraordinarily low given her EGFR and her urine albumin creatinine ratio. And if we're looking at increasing medication burden for this patient, I think there's other things that are more important currently. Great point. Matt, would you even consider an MRA or would you say that just the ACE ARB is enough and you'd think about the SGLT2 inhibitor or are you in agreement with NIAN, no SGLT2 inhibitor? I'm in agreement with NIAN. I think an MRA here wouldn't make sense. There's not substantial albuminuria. You haven't even maximized the ACE and also the only reason to add the MRA would be if you're looking for another agent for blood pressure control but we haven't really talked about that. Great point. And Barbara, just comment, would you add a sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor in someone with an A1C above nine? Usually I would with the proper counseling. There's always a concern about glucosuria and risk of complications because they have such hyperglycemia. So you're concerned about mycotic infections and as a adverse effect. But with appropriate counseling, you could because you could see potential significant decrease in A1C and at levels that we previously didn't have with these potent agents. I just would be cautious. Yeah. And I, a lot of times will work on the glycemic management for the diabetes to get them eight or less. And then if there is additional indication for cardiovascular or renal benefit, that might be when I add the sodium co-transporter inhibitor. She is 70, so she is at higher risk for cardiovascular events and does have high blood pressure. So I do think there is some potential benefit of the sodium glucose co-transport inhibitor, but I would also weigh it against the pill burden and cost to the patient. So all great points there. We're just going to highlight that sort of like our neuropathic pain, sometimes for gastroparesis, especially if they're using a lot of narcotics to get people off of narcotics, these are some alternatives that are recommended by the guidelines, always to keep in mind limiting the narcotics, but also validating a person's pain and addressing their pain, especially in this history of gastroparesis, because I know those of us who practice really find this disease one of the most challenging for our patients. The final thing I just wanted to point out is I did not see statin on this patient, and we mentioned the cardiovascular risk calculator earlier in the lecture. I would just say that the final thing that we might want to consider is high-intensity statin in this patient. And because we have so many great discussions and everything, I'll say what we want to do is mitigate cardiovascular risk. We want to support the patients and we want to empower them. And so this ends session 11 of the Cardiometabolic Echo. Thank you everyone for your time.